from London, everyone, and a very warm welcome to you all to this LSC online public event, wherever you are around the globe. I am Sandra Jovcelovic. I am a professor of social psychology here at the school, and it is my pleasure to be chairing this panel today on rethinking human behavior, critical perspectives on the psychology of COVID. This event forms part of LSE's Shaping the Post-COVID World Initiative, a series of debates about the direction the world could and should be taking after the crisis. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic is an exceptional global crisis and perhaps one of its most central challenges has been to understand and change human behavior. By now we know that different the countries and cultures address this challenge in different ways and with different degrees of success, throwing into question conceptions of behavior as a unified and individual phenomenon that can be managed from a central top-down position. The touching behavior from the complexity of context and collective human agency is narrow at best and at worst can be very dangerous and inefficient indeed, as we have seen again and again during this pandemic. So to address this pressing urgent issues and kick off the academic year, I have with me today an exceptional panel of distinguished psychologists whose research and applied work are at the forefront of societal and community understandings of human behavior. Dr. Rochelle Burgess is a community health psychologist who specializes in community-based approaches to health and a leading voice in the emerging field of social interventions in global mental health. Her work studies the social and psychological dynamics of community engagement in contexts such as South Africa, the UK, Colombia, and Zimbabwe. She is Deputy Director of the UCL Center for Global Non-Communicable Diseases and a lecturer in Global Health at UCL's Institute for Global Health. Professor Amade Graf Eikens is a social psychologist whose research focuses on chronic illnesses, representations, experiences, and care, and on the social, cultural, and health systems aspects of Africa's chronic non-communicable disease, communicable disease burden. Ama has a very strong presence on research and global debates in this area and has been involved in policy development in Ghana, West Africa, and globally. She also has a very strong interest in the history of psychology in Africa and its intersections with critical theory and African studies. Ama is a British Academy Global Professor at UCL Institute of Advanced Studies, where she is leading a project on chronicity and care in African contexts. Professor Helen Joffe is a leading scholar on the psychology of risk, infectious diseases and disasters. Her groundbreaking work on AIDS and Ebola has given us a new theory of risk and illuminated the socio-emotional dynamics underpinning behavior during epidemics and pandemics. She currently leads multiple projects on risk and resilience in the context of cities, disasters, and well-being, advising government and policymakers. Helene is professor of psychology at the Division of Psychology and Language Sciences at UCL. And finally, Steve Riker. Steve is one of the world's leading social psychologists whose work on crowd behavior, collective action, social identity and social change has transformed the field. He is particularly well known for having turned around the notion that crowds and collectives behave irrational, irrationally. His research and policy intervention in fact systematically show the opposite. Human communities can think and think very well. Indeed, frequently they can think better than those leading them. 
Stephen is professor of social psychology at the University of St. Andrews and sits on SAGE, the scientific advisory board for the UK government. He's also now a member of independent SAGE. So we're going to start with each one of our presenters speaking in turn. And depending on time, they will have the chance to react to each other's intervention. After that, we will have time for questions from you, the audience. Please use the chat function that is being managed backstage by the amazing LSE public events team and our very own PBS, Rebecca Lee. So I'm going to turn to Alma and ask her to take the floor. Alma, over to you. Thank you so much, Sandra, um, for inviting me to join this event. Um, I'm going to go straight to it because I'm having internet problems. So, I mean, as you said earlier, when you were introducing me, um, my research focuses on chronic illness representations, experiences and care in African contexts, both on the continent and the diaspora. I've worked with Ghanaian communities in Ghana, in the UK, Netherlands, and Germany, and I've also worked with African and African Caribbean communities in the UK focusing on diabetes, mental health, and associated comorbid um, conditions. I work in the critical social psychology tradition. I was trained at the LSC, actually, which, and, and this, this um, approach focuses on the interface between the individual and society. Theorists talk about how we can conceptualize simultaneously both the power of society and the agency of individuals. And in my work, I've tried to focus on how social psychological theory and methods can draw on other disciplines like anthropology, sociology, history. And because I work in African context, I'm interested in the history of psychology, how psychological knowledge is applied to African cultures and communities, and how this intersects with critical theory, postcolonial theory, and African studies. So that's a bit of a context to what I do. Now, the start of the pandemic um, in January, February, I was struck by the stigmatization of China on Ghana and Twitter. I was in Ghana in 2014 during the Ebola pandemic and Ghana didn't re report a case of Ebola, but it affected um, Liberia, Sierra Leone and Guinea. But rumors of suspected cases, anticipation of infection caused anxiety, fear and stigma in lay and healthcare communities in Ghana. I also remember how the stigmatization of West African countries in the Western media affected the self-image of West Africans, but also had an economic impact. Um, you know, tourism, hospitality, local industries with international ties were severely affected. Um, in Ghana, universities suffered a huge blow in international student enrollment and study abroad, abroad programs. We see this in the UK today. These dynamics played a role in resistance to public health interventions, including opposition to vaccine trials in Ghana. And I thought, you know, how short um, memories are, you know, for, for Ghanaian, uh, you know, um, sort of leading people in Ghana to sort of stigmatize China, I mean, in 2020. Then, of course, pre-existing conditions became a major recurring theme in the media. And I took notice because my work focuses on experiences of the dominant pre-existing conditions, you know, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and stroke. But I was in a sort of a research limbo in March. I mean, I just started, I was the early stages of my new ethnographic project on chronic illness experiences and care in London's West African communities. And I was waiting for my UCL ethical approval to come through. It takes a long time for that to happen. Um, so I couldn't go out and interview West African Londoners, although my prospective study participants were higher risk groups for COVID. But I still had my existing relationships with communities in Ghana, including um, Gamashi, a historically poor and structurally neglected community in Accra. Um, Gamashi, I've worked in Gamashi for the last 10 years. It has um, you know, a complex health burden, um, multidimensional developmental issues. So I worked with um, the University of Ghana team, engaged with the community, gathering mixed data on their responses to COVID and their needs. Um, I was also a member of the Ghana Academy of Sciences Committee on Health, which was commissioned to synthesize health data for the Ghanaian government. And so I spent a number of weeks tracking sort of broader social responses to COVID in Ghana. 
finally, um, because I'm a BAME woman living in Lambeth, London, uh, which was a COVID hotspot in the early days, I lived through and followed the news and politics and COVID and BAME communities. I spoke to friends, family, clipped news articles, you know, kept a journal, developing a kind of a, a sort of an autoethnography really of what was happening, you know, um, in the UK. So I've learned quite a lot over the, the last seven months, seven or eight months. And, and really it's kind of the basic stuff of critical social psychology, the stuff I learned, you know, when I was doing my PhD um, at the LSE. And I'll run through a few concepts and ideas. First idea is cognitive polyphasia. And I've used this concept in my work. Um, it's this idea that in everyday life, there are competing ver versions of reality. We draw on eclectic sources of knowledge and competing beliefs. And we use these with or without psychological discomfort. Now, this is a dominant theme in the way that individuals across cultures and time deal with chronic conditions at the point of diagnosis and over time. And cognitive polyphagia has played out in lay and expert community discourses, both in the UK and in Ghana. If we take a quick look at you know, how the media represents um, COVID or how you know, lay communities represent COVID, we see these elements of competing ideas, beliefs, and so on. Second thing really is complex emotions mixed feelings. It, it really began sort of with social emotions, you know, um, the kind that is tied through um, intergroup relations, transnational relations, you know, fear of the other, schadenfreude, collective anger, distrust. I talked about stigma earlier on, how Ghanaians were stigmatizing China. But as the pandemic shifted as an object of hypothetical ideas, detached observations, abstract jokes, to lived experiences of infection, caregiving, bereavement, job loss, precarity. The emotions shifted to the individual interpersonal level, you know, fear, anxiety, worry. It was always mixed. People talked about their feelings in, in ways that suggested that we're sort of picking our way through a very complex situation here. I mean, some of the emotions were functional, some were dysfunctional, but a lot of it was rational. It was based in the, the complexities of what we're living in. The third thing really was this idea of sort of the national psyche that we, we you know, often discussed in societal psychology. And I was struck really by similarities between the discourse around great British exceptionalism um, and the discourse around Ghanaian sovereignty, especially in April um, when the Ghanaian government received a $1 billion COVID relief loan from the IMF. It raised issues around you know, um, how African governments are constantly kind of, you know, um, seeking help from, you know, Western um, um, development partners and so on. And another idea is this idea of the pandemics as familiar alien threats. Again, in social psychology, the idea of the familiar alien threat is a category of phenomena or people, you know, like madness, the mentally ill, um, minority ethnic groups, um, the proverbial familiar strangers that we may already know, but maintain in an unfamiliar position because they represent danger, chaos, tra transgression. And, you know, each time a pandemic strikes, communities make sense of it through collective memories of old ones. They never fully anchor them. Um, at the same time, the practical responses demanded of the complex crisis that ensue change societies in fundamental ways. And it has real implications on how we think about collective memory, how memory, um, you know, mediates the way that we anchor meanings um, of COVID or previous pandemic and how this can inform public health interventions, you know, health communication, health promotion, and so on. And finally, the idea, the concept of intersectionality um, for some communities, COVID was intersectional from day one. Um, it wasn't a case of, let's deal with the epidemiology, the virology and public health aspects, and then we'll worry about the economic impact. COVID was a medical, psychological, financial, religious, existential and political problem all at once. And it's been the case all the way through. So as a critical social psychologist, these evolving issues have given me a lot to think about, to feel my way through, to work with, and especially with communities I've developed a relationship with over a long period of time. I mean, I've now begun piloting interviews for my London ethnographic study, and I'm weaving issues around 
the multidimensional impact of COVID into the questions about living with chronic conditions in London. Um, but more broadly, I'm thinking about how these lessons and insights can be incorporated into developing sustainable models of care with communities um, in the future. So that's my pitch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ama. Uh, you gave us lots to think about, and I'm sure we'll be able to come back to the issues you, you presented, you brought into the conversation. I'm going to now hand over to Helen Joffe. Uh, please, Helene, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'll share my screen. Um, Hi, so um, I've given myself the topic of psychology unmasked, partly because I'm wanting to talk about the mask as a behavior and use of the mask. But uh, in fact, I'm going to delve into a deeper, broader sense range of issues in order to do so. So historically, Disruptions of the scale of the COVID-19 pandemic have led to major societal transformation. And so the question is, will the psychology of human behavior be changed by this pandemic? Well, I would argue for two ways in which it should change uh, according to the evidence thus far. It should put center stage material inequities that un underpin risk behaviors and also values as determinants of behavior. So I'll cover each in turn in a little more depth in the time that I have. So in order to think about these changes, we first need to characterize the status quo and in a nutshell, currently, both the psychology of risk and of behavior change have overemphasized individual determinants of behavior, be it control enshrined in the concepts self-efficacy, which some would see as an opposite of fatalism, um, enshrined in the concept of outcome expectancy, among other control variables that we talk about. Also within the psychology of behavior change, habit plays a major role, as does personal experience. So these things very much center around the individual and what happens in the individual psyche, be it generally cognitively, but also increasingly emotively. Either way though, it's something that happens within the individual psyche, our response to risk and our behaviors in relation to it. So my two arguments are firstly that COVID lays bare the material inequities that underpin risk behavior and therefore the individual determinants of behavior are laid bare. So we know that in the COVID-19 pandemic, BAME people are more likely to die from COVID-19 than white populations in both the US and the UK. And why is this so? So what are determinants of this inequity in death rates? One is living in densely populated communities. The other is living in multi-generational households. And if we try to tie this into behavior, you're three times less likely to be able to self-isolate if you live in a multi-generational household or low SES. And low SES households are six times less likely to be able to work from home. So this is to do with the kind of roles that you may occupy in your work life in lower SES communities, as well as other variables. So we can no longer see behavior purely in terms of existing frameworks like the theory of planned behavior, the theory of reasoned action, even nudges. Rather control or planning your behavior, planned behavior or reasoned action is superseded by an environment that can severely limit one's control. And 
in a really different realm, we also need to think so behaviors can't be focused on purely in terms of the individual, but they also can't be focused on purely in terms of cognition and emotion. We have to put values center stage. I think we cannot deny that values lie at the heart of COVID related behaviors. If we think of mask use in the US, masks are a symbol of protection for Democrats and of wimpiness and disease hoax for extreme Republicans. And so just one model, really a very strong model within psychology of people's values is that of the following that comes from Mary Douglas's work, but has now been used heavily in the work of Kahan et al at Yale. So this is idea that uh, people's values can range from hierarchical to egalitarian on one axis and from individualistic to communitarian on another. So you may wonder, how would this link to COVID? Well, Kahan et al have linked this very heavily to a whole lot of other risks, and I'm sure we'll very soon have uh, similar figures for COVID. Um, if we go to my next slide. So um, this, just to contextualize what I'm showing you here, is how people view the risks associated with different issues or risks at different points along the two dimensions of hierarchy, egalitarianism, and individualism, communitarianism. So that, that what you see in green is um, what they see as low risk, and that what you see in red is what they see as high risk. So the hierarchical individualist, so I guess Trump would be a uh, an, an archetype of this, um, the hierarchical individualists see climate change, nuclear power and guns as low risk, yet they see immigration and gun control at high risk. And at the exact opposite end of the spectrum, what would be quite left leaning Democrats, you would find that climate change, nuclear power and guns are seen as high risk, while immigration and gun control are seen as low risk. So the very point here is that your values, your ideologies shape your risk perceptions as we would have traditionally thought about them. So I think in that very short run through uh, these two issues, I think that it's been a long time coming that we put socioeconomic status, status in equity center stage in the uptake of risks and risk communications. And I don't think that really has happened until now when I think we just cannot avoid that the statistics point in, in the direction that we have no option but to look at it this way. And I think it's also a long time coming that we realize that behavior follows from and expresses values. And I hope that these two dimensions add to what many even within the critical tradition have talked about which in terms of complex emotions and representations, they add further dimensions to what underpins the representation. So, I'm, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helene. Uh, thank you for uh, bringing the problem of uh, cultural values uh, to our discussion and for making very, very clear the importance of socioeconomic determinants, material inequities, in particular on how we have been experiencing this pandemic. Something is incredibly evident and uh, needs certainly be part of our models for understanding uh, what shapes and determines behavior. Uh, we're going to continue and I'm going to ask Rochelle to uh, please uh, take the floor. Okay, thanks very much, Sandra. Uh, now I will do the difficult work of trying to share my screen smoothly. Okay, so if my colleagues could give me a nod to let me know if that is all right. Fabulous, thank you. Um, so thank you very much, Sandra, for inviting me to be a part of such a, an amazing and important conversation. 
Um, and I think for me, one of the things that I have um, been most, um, most surprised by and struck by in terms of how we talk about behavior in the context of COVID um, is, is the way in which we try to position action and engagement in the world as it, it can be separated from the social and community histories that people live and have lived through um, every day. Um, I think in particular, um, I sort of think about Ama's reflections on sort of collective memory and, and um, Helene's comments on um, on risk and values uh, and the importance of thinking about how all of these different dynamics come together to make up and shape people's everyday lives and the way that they act in their world um, and ultimately what is possible for action. Um, and for me, I have really felt that what we see and what is manifest is always anchored to historical experiences to narratives, to the stories we tell ourselves and uh, we tell each other and are told to us through time. And they very much create the possible for what we see today. Um, and this is particularly important in terms of the current work and that I've been doing um, during the uh, COVID pandemic um, with young people from Black African, Black Caribbean, Asian and other minority ethnic backgrounds in South London with the fantastic organization, um, the Wandsworth Community Empowerment Network that I've been working with for many years now, trying to understand how young people um, understand and experience and achieve, attempt to achieve well-being in this very contested space, a space where they're told every day about their vulnerabilities, where they um, experience and, and know about the challenges that they've, they've had to deal with for some time and feel very strongly the way in which the current historical moment magnifies and intensifies that for them. Um, so one of the big things that we did in, in part of this study with around 40 young people um, was this activity called story completion. Um, and the main aim of story completion is to give um, people a chance to um, reflect on difficult challenges in society in ways that are safe and in those reflections and the creation of story and narrative highlight the, the representations or the discourses that are available to us in terms of making sense of the world and then ultimately establishing action. And so in this piece of the study, we asked young people to make three different stories. Um, and the first story was based on a STEM where a family is all sitting together watching the prime minister's update um, and um, I won't go into too much detail about sort of the themes that are emerge, emerge there, but some of the things that were highlighted is that um, people were very much aware, aware of sort of risks and, and, and how the pandemic has made their families and households potentially more vulnerable and, and also their own role in sort of maintaining and promoting well-being in, in family units. Um, this stem, along with the second stem, which was around a young people in conversation around um, COVID in relation to sort of 5G theory. So this sort of folk or as young people sometimes called it a conspiracy theory about where COVID comes from. Um, both of the, these stems also highlighted sort of ways in which they felt that they could not trust what was being said to them. Um, but also a, 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 an interest in sort of maintaining relationships and, and connections with their peers and how that tension is created and, and trying to make sense of these competing ideas, things that they believe to be true, um, things that they want to believe and, and, and have faith in, in terms of government messaging, but feeling their lack of clarity just wasn't enough to enable them to act in ways that they felt could maintain their own safety and their family safety. Um, and then the third stem, which is where I will focus most of my discussion for the rest of my 10 minutes, or less now, um, more like six, um, is the third stem, which featured a young person um, uh, who is approaching their friends in a park. And through the story, the sort of introduction to the story, it emerges that there is going to be a likely encounter with law enforcement. Um, and so what in the making and explaining of the possible pathways that come through the creation of, of this story, and its multiple endings really highlights um, some key 
concepts and ideas that I think are really important to understanding in order to promote and develop the environments that will enable young people to make healthy choices, um, as opposed to thinking about them as individual actions that are devoid from, from histories or context or resources, as others have been saying so far. Um, so the first of this, these ideas is that this idea that the past is very much the present. And so we know that in the UK, historically, people of color in this, in, in this region are more likely to be subject to police surveillance. They're more likely to be stopped and searched. Um, and these long histories have not changed. Um, a recent report sort of in May or June by Liberty, which is a social justice organization, um, reported that people from Black, Asian, and minority ethnic backgrounds were um, more likely to be fined by police under lockdown guidelines. Um, and a person of color was ultimately 54% more likely to be fined in the UK. Um, so this narrative um, of the history in the past is very much about now and sort of feeds into decisions and, ex and experiences um, of young people today. Um, this feeling of surveillance and the experience of surveillance was a very real narrative for these young people and shaped their sense making to a great deal in this context. So many of the people in our study had very um, clear personal accounts of their own um, experiences with the police that involved stop and search encounters or, or other deep sort of questioning around the nebulous idea of um, suspicious behavior. Um, and, and the quote here is from one particular young person who was reflecting on their own experiences in relation to the story um, and about a time that they were asked about by a police officer for their name as they were sort of walking home from school. And sort of the fear that sort of was embodied in that in that encounter was that you know you know the feel the fear of giving up your name and what does it mean for a police officer to officer to have your name and put your name on a record um, in the context of trying to dream and imagine a positive future for yourself these are young people who are all actively engaged in their communities high achieving young people in schools and and really sort of trying to find their way through these experiences of, of everyday oppressions and injustice. Um, and how does something like this feature into the types of behavior we are asking publics to promote around things like track and trace and understanding and unwillingness of certain groups to put themselves forward for added surveillance when what the history of surveillance of themselves and their family members and their communities have, have meant by the same systems that are supposed to take care of them and promote their well-being. Um, and so what I'd like to do is read through one of bits of a story from um, 16 and 17 year olds that we talked to um, in my last sort of minutes or two minutes um, and, and then sort of wrap up very um, quickly um, about a future and, and sort of highlighting that there is more than the negative, the possibilities still remain. So in this particular story, um, they reflected on um, the shared global energy of what it means to be a person of color at this historical moment, um, the way in which what happens somewhere else to black people feels like it potentially is happening to you or could happen to you, the increased sense of vulnerability, this collective shared story, memory, personhood. Um, the ways in which young people don't engage with, want to engage in these situations, they self-regulate their behavior in ways that can have negative health consequences. So lots of people talked about, even though they missed their friends and would love to see them, if they approached a situation where they saw the police, they would just leave because they couldn't predict it. Even if 10, six out of 10 times, nothing would happen, four out of 10 times, something bad could happen and they didn't want to have that as their experience. Um, they reflected on what sort of happens in terms of misunderstandings and misreadings um, and representations of situations where um, the police and, and, and young people sort of engage in, in discussions and, and what it's like to be someone from a stereotyped group. Um, young people are aware of the fact that they're being stereotyped, they're being monitored. Um, and the sort of dangers of that. But in spite of this, um, young people ended their stories with hope. There were these hero narratives and, and Emerson is the name of the fictional character. It was genderless and young people often ascribed a gender to it um, at times, but 
ultimately what we, we found is that um, uh, there, is, there is hope. Um, they were, there was a hero narrative at times. Community members would come in and try to protect the children. Other times, um, police officers, more senior police officers would come onto the scene and sort of chastise the others who were doing stereotypical behavior. And in these sorts of restorative acts, um, there is this notion of potentially maintaining trust in systems, which speaks to the fact that people can find their way to believing in structures and systems that have failed them before through sort of tangible acts of contrition and acceptance and acknowledgement of, of past wrongs. Um, and I just sort of constantly think a little bit about um, the work of a poet in the, the US, Langston Hughes, his poem Harlem about sort of oppression in, um, in the US. And it starts off with this really powerful phrase, what happens to a dream deferred? Um, and for me, it was very clear that, um, you know, we, the dream that is deferred and the ideas and the stresses, we pass them along in stories to future generations, but we also pass along hope and, and hope is essentially what must be the starting point for us. And I think if we were to do more work with communities where we start with communities, asking them about their previous experiences, their perspectives on what types of resources are required to act in the ways that we need them to in order to promote their well-being, um, there is hope and healthy change is possible. So that's it for me. I used an extra minute and a half. I apologize, um, but I just want to very quickly um, say a huge thanks to our project team, Nancy, who's been my research assistant and huge help um, the past few months um, at UCL. Um, at WCEN, um, their director, Malik, who is our co-PI, Tanya and Owen, who are amazing um, uh, program directors steering the ship, and of course, the group of young peer researchers from these communities who have worked with us to facilitate these discussions with young people. It is impossible without community, so thank you to all of you, and thanks very much for my time. Thank you very much, Rochelle. That was brilliant to listen to and a very good grounding on the everyday experiences of COVID uh, and on the incredible diversity and variation uh, we find when it comes to the behavior uh, associated with COVID and the external societal determinants of that behavior. So let's turn now to our last speaker, Steve Riker. Steve, over to you. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. And, and also, Sandra, thank you for promoting me to SAGE. I'm actually not on SAGE. Um, I'm a member of Spy B which is the behavioral science subgroup, which feeds into SAGE. I should say that I've never quite understood what behavioral science is. Uh, I think it's an attempt for psychologists who feel physics envy to think they're a bit more credible if you put the word science uh, in the way we describe ourselves. Um, and that's apposite because what I'm gonna talk about today is in a sense the, uh, uh, the construction and the use or rather the misuse of psychology. And I think psychology has been deeply deeply and toxically misused in this pandemic. Um, it started back in March, started before the lockdown, started with the uh, notion you will remember of behavioral fatigue. And the interesting thing about behavioral fatigue, it was an attempt to say that psychologically, human beings are frail, uh, human beings can't deal with uh, difficult situations. We can't deal uh, with complexity. We certainly can't deal with stress. And if you tried to put us under lockdown, we simply would not be able to cope with it. Um, and that was used to justify delaying lockdown, probably by at least a week, which arguably cost tens of thousands of lives. So the misuse of psychology was literally murderous in this pandemic. And the reason why I think it is a misuse of psychology is that when you look at the evidence, both before this pandemic and previous pandemics and in this pandemic, then the limits on adherence, say, to lockdown, which were real, and there was real fatigue, but it was not psychologically so psychological. So on the one hand, it had to do with information. If you don't give people clear information about risk and what to do about it, then they are not going to follow rules because they don't think they're important and they don't know what the rules are that you should follow. So if you fail to give people clear information, well, no, they won't adhere to what you ask. 
And the second point, and the point's been made already, it was made very clearly by a number of the previous speakers, is that if people did not adhere, it had nothing to do with their motivation. So yes, there was that data uh, from May showing that both poor people and people from ethnic minorities were more likely to break lockdown, three to six times. But when you looked at their motivation, their motivation was exactly the same. It had nothing to do with motivation. It had everything to do with the difficulties of staying at home and putting food on the table. It had to do with material inequalities. And again, that came from not psychological failure. It came from a failure to give people support, a failure of the various measures, the furlough scheme, the self-employment scheme, to actually allow people to do what was being asked of them, the psychologization of fatigue was in effect blaming the failures of government on the failures of the public. It was not an explanation, it was a means of deflecting accountability. Now we're seeing similar psychologization going on at the moment, quite central to the government's argument. And that was very clear, for instance, a few weeks back, still today, with the notion that young people are to blame. Why are we having a spike in infections? It's because you awful young people are going out and having parties, uh, and that's what leading to, is leading to the spike in infection. Now, what was undeniable, the evidence was clear, was that young people were more likely to be infected. But the step was going from uh, the probability of being infected to inferring that it had to do something to do with behavior, um, that it had something to do with culpable behavior in particular. So the fact that young people or any group is more infected is because they're more exposed to the infection. They come into contact with others. And the question is, why do they come into contact? Now, it could be that they are breaking the rules, but it could equally be that they are following the rules. They're doing what they're told. Go back to work. If you don't go back to work, you might lose your job. Go to the pub. It's your patriotic duty to go to the pub. And so people do what they're told, and the government turns around and then blames them for doing what they've been pressured to do. So the first step that is taken then is to psychologize what might be uh, behaviors which have to do with circumstance, with possibility, uh, and so on. And then we go from explaining it in terms of behavior to pathologizing it. It comes from toxic behaviors. It comes from misbehavior. It comes from these mythical parties. And what are the problems with that explanation? Well, first of all, I mean, it's just plain wrong. I, I, I came across some wonderful data from the Scottish police. I was in a meeting last week, and they showed 440 house gatherings have been called to. Only 13, less than 2% were large gatherings of more than 15 people. Nearly all of them were gatherings of five, six people, slightly more than you should, but not large house parties. And what was even more interesting is when the police knocked on the door of these people, these people would say, why are you looking at me? I'm not the problem. We're not having parties. And that begins to point to, as I say, some of the difficulties of, of this psychologization and this blame narrative. One is that it makes people complacent. You set up a demonic other who is misbehaving and people who, from their own perspective, think, well, no, I am behaving, but I'm just slightly bending the rules, don't see themselves as the problem. And so they cumulatively um, uh, go beyond the rules and increase the, the possibilities of infection. That, that, that's one of the problems. A second problem which uh, arises from this is that um, you alienate those who are uh, perhaps not complying. If you say to young people, you're the problem, you know, you, you're all bad, it's all down to you, then it's not a particularly way of, uh, good way of persuading people. The third problem, of course, is yet again, it deflects from government behavior. It says the problems we're having at the moment aren't due to the failures of the test and trace system. 
They're not due to the lack of support we're giving to people to do what we're asking for them. And the big issue at the moment, incidentally, is that of self-isolation. People talk about test and trace. Test and trace is not about testing and tracing. It's about getting people to self-isolate. And the studies, the Corsair studies that came out, showed that less than 20% of people, less than 20%, less than one in five, is actually self-isolating. So the whole system is pointless without that. And why aren't they self-isolating? Well, think about it at the moment. What, what's entailed in self-isolating? Well, first of all, you might lose your job. Secondly, you're gonna lose income. Thirdly, what if you're a multi-generational uh, family? Fourthly, what if you have caring responsibilities to elderly uh, parents or to children? Fifthly, uh, I, I could go on. And instead of addressing those questions and asking how you can help what you do, again, is to say, well, it's your fault. And that's one of the big reasons why actually a lot of the measures and interventions aren't working at the moment, because we're not dealing with the biggest hole in the system. So these pathologizing, psychologizing explanations actually are problematic on a whole series of levels. And I just want to finish by pointing to one further problem. You see, if you look at the literature, on adherence to authority. If you look at the literature on why people obey the law, on the whole, it's not for instrumental reasons. It's not because you're gonna be punished. It's not a very effective way of getting people to obey the law for punishment, because it simply means that if you don't think you're gonna be punished, you're gonna break the law. And uh, you're certainly gonna adhere less in different areas where you're not gonna be punished. The best way to get people to adhere to the law is for them to believe that the law and the lawmakers are on these side, on their side, that these uh, laws, these regulations, these measures, if they're about COVID, are being done for us by authorities who are of us and understand us. And of course, if you treat people as the problem, and if you blame people, uh, as if there's something wrong with them. Yesterday, according to Lord Bethel, it's because we had too many children's birthday parties. That was the problem. Then you set yourself against the public. You alienate yourself from the public. You treat people as other, and they're going to treat you as other, and compliance is going to fall. But on top of that, one of the things you're going to do, if you blame particular groups, is you're going to divide the public. You're going to lead the public to see their neighbours as the problem. You're going to ask people to look at their neighbours with suspicion. And if there's one thing, I think, that comes out of this pandemic, it is actually the power of community. Various others have talked about community. It's the power of collective identity. Literature on disasters shows that on the whole, when there is a disaster, because we have common fate, a common experience, there is a fragile sense of shared identity. That sense of shared identity has got to be buttressed by government. First of all, rhetorically, but then practically by making it possible for all of us to act in the same way, for instance, uh, to stay at home. But once you create that sense of shared identity, it leads to people to act for the communal good. If you act in terms of individual risk, and most people aren't at high risk, you're going to think, well, I might as well go out. Not a big risk to me, big hassle staying in. If you think in terms of shared identity, you're going to think, well, actually, the cost of going out is catastrophic. I'm going to kill people in my community. So that sense of shared community is completely central, and there's increasing empirical data to support that. Recent 67 nation study um, with 46,000 people showed that a sense of belonging to a national community correlates with adherence, a more local uh, uh, identification with communities. Same type of thing. So what the government is doing with its blame narrative is to alienate itself from the public and to destroy that sense of collective identity. And that leads to the final point I want to make and the brief point I want to make. For me, if this pandemic points to the dangers of psychologization, Actually, what it also does 
is points to the contrast between two very different psychologies, because psychologization tends to be about the frailty and the fragility and the venality of the public. It's about how we're all weak and bad as individuals, and therefore we need a paternalistic government to rule over us, to guide us, to uh, chastise us, to tell us off, uh, to threaten us. And that's the model which is actually very widespread in government, this, this paternalistic sense of people who don't know their own minds and therefore need a government to look after them. It's a rhetoric, actually, which justifies government and therefore uh, tends to be popular uh, of, of governments, in my experience, both of, uh, of left and right, although uh, not very left in the recent history of, of, of the UK. So on the one hand, you have that psychology of individual fragility and frailty, which is central to notions like you can nudge instantly. On the other hand, you have a psychology of collective resilience, that when we stop thinking in terms of I, but in terms of we, when we begin to support each other, then we are powerful. And then we can look after each other and support each other and act for the common good. And the role of government is not to be paternalistic, but to scaffold and support our own self-organization. So I do think that this pandemic, number one, shows the danger of psychologization. Number two, shows the contrast between a psychology which is dominant of individual frailty and the need to replace it with a psychology of collective resilience. And thirdly, thereby, forces us to rethink the fundamental relationship between individual uh, and government, or rather community, uh, and government. And if there's one good thing that I hope comes out of this pandemic is that that then begins to realize itself in terms of alternative forms of government and alternative forms of self-organization. Thank you, Steve. That that was uh, uh, very, very um, opposite. And I think uh, the questions are coming in and the audience is starting to engage with all the issues you have presented. Before I open to, to the questions, we do have some time in case you would like to react to each other's uh, comments. If anyone would like to respond briefly, very briefly, or ask a further question uh, within the panel, please do so now. Um, if any one of you would like to do that. Helene. I'm struck by how we've all talked about inequity among, among other things. Um, so that's really been a unifying theme across all of us. And we've also all talked uh, about a way of thinking about psychology, which isn't necessarily centered on individualist ideals. And so you, you get, you know, but from all from really different angles. So I think that's, you know, those are the unifying themes that I see so far. Indeed. Any other comment from our panel? So, so I think I'm going to start taking questions from the public. Uh, our audience is engaging with of you and I am going to start with a the first question from Michelle Klotz, uh, King's College student to Ama. How do you get around the ethnocentric weird bias in psychological and behavioral research considering your focus is on group that are neglected by this research. And from Jenny Wardle, uh, if values, news values are surfacing, how do we encapsulate those into change activities and practical outcomes that play to these values? Ama, do you want to engage with the first question? I think yes. the other one is for the whole panel. Yes. Yeah. Thanks very much. I mean, that's an important question. I mean, I've always sort of worked with uh, minority ethnic um, populations. I mean, I've worked with, as I said earlier, with African communities on the continent and in the UK. Um, but I also, I guess, in a way, sort of trained in the tradition that uses sort of mixed methods, right? So lots of community engagement, sort of using qualitative methods. 
doing slow research, engaging with communities over time, trying to understand who they are and how they organize their lives. Um, and, you know, one of the things also is there are different kinds of psychology, you know, I mean, the, you know, Euro the European tradition of psychology is pretty much sociological social psychology. So it pushes you to actually sort of um, um, place um, research communities at the heart of what you do. Secondly, I get around this also by actually turning a critical lens on psychology as a profession. You know, I mean, it's got a, I mean, Steve talked earlier about, you know, how psychology has been abused during the COVID um, um, sort of pandemic and period. But the abuse of psychology, particularly in the way that it's been applied to, you know, non-European populations, it has a long history. And so if you're a sort of a, a black psychologist working in, 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 in the tradition, you always have to think about what ideas you're using, what concepts you're using, what methods you're using, and center communities at the heart of what you do. So that's how, I mean, I, I, I get around that. I hope I answered the question. Yes, thank you. Let me carry on asking some other questions. A question for Helene. What positive outcomes do you think would surface from beginning to place more importance on socioeconomic inequities to decision, in decision-making in society? In fact, this is a question uh, to the whole panel and it comes from Emily Morby, an Oxford student. Helene, do you want yes, to? Yes, well, well, obviously, obviously we then Firstly, I think us psychologists need to work in interdisciplinary ways on risks like COVID. We can't obviously think purely, so this, that was mentioned by Anna about intersectionality. We can't actually, from a purely psychological perspective, address uh, socioeconomic status inequalities. But I think just actually the recognition that inequity is at the root of, for example, as Steve put it, um, not being able to socially isolate. Not always, it's not always inequity that does that. You might be a you know, middle-class mother who has to continue to look after her kids or her parents. But it is seems to, the weight of inequity seems to really fall on lower SES groups. And these groups actually um, need to be, it, their needs need to be thought of but we can't, I don't think, operate within psychology to be doing that. We have to work with other disciplines and obviously the system, the system needs to change. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. I have now a question for Steve. Do you think the opposition against measures like masks or social distancing was a consequence mainly of the initial response in March, April of the UK government, namely delaying lockdown and not taking the epidemic seriously? Can I first go back to that last question? So I think that last question was really interesting and I wanted to come in on it because I think it has really profound implications for psychology and about the need for us to move away from a discipline centered on cognition to a discipline centered on practice. Um, because one of the things about psychology that is bizarre is we have, we, we do our studies in these magical worlds where what you think translates into action, right? So in our experiments and our studies, if you know you have intentions and desires that's good enough we often don't look at behaviors we take intentions for actual behaviors but of course whatever your intentions enacting those intentions actual practice is always going to be within a context of uh, resources of social relations which is i mean in the end i mean depending on how you define class what class is all about class is rooted in your different relationships to the means of production and therefore your ability uh, to enact forms of action so i think to me the the notion of taking uh, class in its broader sense in its analytic sense as something rooted in the structure of practice uh, actually means we have to fundamentally shift our whole understanding of our, of, of our discipline and get away from the assumption that thinking something or intending something is the same as doing it. It's such an obvious point, but it's so obviously missing. Um, masks, well, 
actually one of the interesting things about masks is that mask wearing um, is pretty consensual. I mean, what, one of the problems we have in this pandemic is the representation of uh, what people are doing is dominated very much by media values. So the media love violations, right? Um, you know, panic buying, we had all this stuff about panic buying. Well, a picture of Tesco's where people are fighting over loo rolls gets into the newspapers. A picture of Tesco's when people are buying new news rolls isn't news. Somebody staying in in a dull way isn't a headline. A rave is a headline. Equally the same with wearing masks. And actually, uh, wearing masks went from about 20% to 70 or 80% very quickly when it was made uh, compulsory. And the point about making it compulsory was not about enforcement, it was about defining a clear norm. It was saying it's important so you've got to do it. Um, the problem was that for some politicians, um, then uh, making something compulsory is the same as enforcement. Uh, and actually the, the most powerful ways of enforcing something is to make it normative so there are social processes of regulating behaviour. Uh, and I think my, my sense of it and the way reasons why it went up was because it became socially normative, almost mm. irrelevant of uh, punishment and irrelevant of uh, uh, you know, compulsion, it became normative. And I think uh, the, the, the shift, another really worrying shift at the moment is the shift towards a punitive stance, which I think uh, an enforcement stance. Uh, and I think that would be deeply counterproductive and again, would disrupt relations between mm. authority and community and also would divide community. Yes. Thank you, Stephen. There is a question uh, for Rochelle. How can we create the time and space to acknowledge past wrongs properly when in the midst of a pandemic, we often feel seized by urgency in a sense that we need to act quickly? Uh, yeah, that's a really tough <laughs> one. Um, I think, I think we're sort of, feeling that tension between, so this idea of urgency is very much a big part of the emergency discourse around health and pandemics. And the power of that often means that you get to push through actions very quickly, sometimes actions that are a little bit sloppy in the name of response, because we just sort of need response. And I think about that globally, as opposed to rather um, locally, where things were not very quick. Um, but I think that Acknowledging past wrongs does not necessarily need to be slow. It could take very sort of large scale public admittances of wrong. So when you look at the movements around the removal of um, statues associated with slave traders and slavery and the ways in which those actions um, sort of signify people's interest and desire to push something, um, it creates sort of a discursive space for discussion to happen. And I think what COVID has done is created a lot of opportunities for discursive spaces to have people in positions of symbolic power and authority acknowledge when they make mistakes, but that has not happened. And, and so I, I really sort of feel that um, it's these, those opportunities don't necessarily take as much time as we think. It's not necessarily about being in a mic in the space of a micro community and sitting down face to face with with every group. It's about creating a, a space for a discourse or taking capitalizing on discourse in a positive way mm. um, to sort of to to to, to accept and, and acknowledge something that has been affecting and affected the lives of people for generations and generations. So that's, that's my thought on that. And I just wanted to sneak in one thing about um, psychology and the future of psychology, because I was really sort of um, clicking, clicking in to sort of um, Steve and um, Helene's comments about what psychology needs to be. Um, and I suppose as a community psychologist, I feel that those tools and mechanisms are already there. Um, it's, it's very much a discipline that has as its heart an interest in transformative engagement. And because of that, it engages with people in a different way. So it doesn't 
necessarily work on people, it works with people. And by switching those two words, it opens more space for the development of trust, for the building of relationships that can be, become transformative on small scale and, and large scale, sort of more sort of collectivist and activist types of engagement around research and asking the question about who research is for. So it's a sort of positionalities that start to change the types of questions we ask and the ways that we work with people. Um, and, and, and I think that we already have that, you know, as Alma says, there are many, many different types of psychology out there. And I think that these disciplines actually exist in the cracks and crevices of sort of the things that get more mainstream. And I would feel that it'd be really important to highlight and push forward these disciplines that are already starting to, starting to do and have been doing that work um, alongside marginalized communities for many, many years. Thank you, Rochelle. I'm going to take, uh, th there are lots of questions coming in. So why do the panel think the UK government seemed unable to learn from the lessons of something as recent as Ebola and community messaging? Anyone would like to take this? this particular question. Why don't we learn from past experience and from um, because other models? There, there are so many models around the world where things seem to be working just fine or at least a bit better, if not entirely better. So any ideas on Helene? Well, in terms of community messaging, I'm, I'm not muted. Uh, in terms of community messaging, particularly, I mean, I think we shouldn't overemphasize how unknown it was that this was going to become a pandemic of this scale. So, other coronaviruses in very recent history have really had far, far fewer deaths. You know, we're talking about 800 in SARS, about 900 for MERS. So the expectation is that we have to also not overreact. And so you have to, you have to take that into account, that, you, that the government was in, it can be sometimes in quite a difficult position because it doesn't want to overreact. So in terms of messaging particularly, I think we have to take that into account. And um, in general, in terms of taking the, the lessons of other countries more to heart, and even of the history of, what works in messaging, because one thing I wanted to say um, is that actually the, one of the most successful health campaigns in history is the Swiss AIDS campaign. And there the messaging was very much about community, identity, we're all in this together, no one is to blame, let's get over it. And that it, for me, it has been a pity that I think there's been a, just a, quite a haphazard use of risk communication turning partly to behavioral scientists, but also not thinking about history and the history of yes. what has worked. Yes, and thank you, Helene. And if I may say, I think you had a fantastic contribution during the AIDS crisis, because the idea that uh, you could blame the other or not my group was turned around by research such as yours at the time, where the message had to be that everyone could actually get AIDS. And when this message started to get through, things started to get better. But Ama and then Steve, uh, did you want to say something, Ama? Ama? Yeah, just, yeah, thanks, thanks, Sandra. I mean, just a few thoughts, really. I mean, um, one of the things we have to realize also, I guess, is where the pandemic is happening. So for instance, with Ebola, it happened out there in, in, in Africa, in West Africa. Um, the, the, the response was a typical response of Western governments intervening on you know, global health um, crises in far-flung um, areas, to use Helen's, um, one of Helen's paper themes, you know, illnesses in far-flung sort of areas. So the response is a little different. Again, it feeds into, you know, huge interventions from Europe or from North America within the global health tradition um, and essentially sort of telling people what to do and how to sort of respond to things. I mean, with, 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 with um, 
sorry, with COVID, I mean, this is probably the first time in, I guess, our collective lifetimes that we've experienced a pandemic that's truly global. All the other pandemics have happened in other places, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. So it's kind of out there. It's not quite something that affects you. So I think that also plays a role to a large extent, at least my perspective looking at what's happening in Ghana and what's happening in the UK, why there was a bit of a, a kind of a confused first couple of months where it was like, so what do we do about this? What models do we have? How do we sort of respond to this? And then obviously you then started seeing the cracks, right? The fault lines in society. And, and one of the things that always to be charitable, I found interesting with sort of media narratives was always this question about, Oh, so why is it that BAME communities are more affected? I mean, there's meaning saturation around that. We know that inequality is there. We know that we have, you know, structural inequality with healthcare. So I think these historical factors are, are very important in understanding how the UK government has kind of responded to this. First time there's an infectious disease that's affecting UK populations. It's a very different type of um, animal. Yeah. Thank you, Ama. Steve, you wanted to come in. So on this, I mean, at one level, there's a really simple answer. It's ideology. I mean, in, in Spy B, we, many of the things we've been talking about, we injected into government. We talked, for instance, about the, the critical nature of co-production and the need to work with people and not impose upon them. We uh, were very clear about the need to try and foster a sense of collective identity. We are very clear about the need to draw upon group norms. We are very clear about you know, issues of inequities and issues of communication with marginalized communities. All those points were made, not least because you know, there were some quite brilliant health psychologists, people like Susan Mickey and people like Val Curtis and people like Lucy Yardley, who'd done that work on Ebola and AIDS and so on. Chris Burnell, an, an, another example. And it was systematically ignored. Not only was it systematically ignored, at times it was systematically contradicted. I mean, I, I spent long days with emails from others whose hearts fell when, uh, you know, you listened to Boris Johnson talking, not least when we listened to him talking just the other day and going into his blame narrative. So why? Well, ideology on multiple levels. First of all, that paternalistic individualist ideology which says well look the, the, the people are like children they can't take bad news they can't take difficult news and therefore we have to have this relentless boosterism about how wonderful things are and of course the parents can't admit to their weaknesses and say sorry and say we we got things wrong so there's ideology on that level there's an ideology, for instance, in terms of uh, the ideology of blame and punishment, which is right-wing Tory law and order ideology, you know, the pretty Patels of this world. And the, perhaps the most egregious example comes down to the testing system, which has failed and failed and failed again, right? We, we didn't build it up in advance. We uh, closed it down in mid-March. When we built it, we built it up on a private sector centralized model when all the public health people and all the epidemiologists say, no, you need testing and above all, you need tracing based on local public health because they know their patch. They know how to do the work of tracing contacts. They can knock on doors. They can do what's called shoe level epidemiology. It didn't happen in part because of ideology. And of course, in part, because of material interests, all those private sector uh, organizations, many of them having close links to government, made millions, if not billions of pounds out of it. So in many ways, it's ideology. In other ways, it's simple uh, material interests. And in yet other ways, it's precious close in all the awarding of contracts to private sector organizations to corruption. Uh, it's not because they didn't know. It's not because they weren't told. Thank you. Let me take another question from Louis Kernahan. That's one of our very own PBS students. Thank you, Louis, for your question. Do you guys think that having to study at home has facilitated and increased the attainment gap for white and BAME students? If so, what can institutions do to combat this? 
So this is about the situation our students are in, working from home, and what is this uh, specific set of circumstances is doing in relation to the attainment gap. Yeah? I'm sorry to speak again. Okay. I will let you go and the then... <laughs> that at school level, if on average, uh, children from most deprived backgrounds lost four months of education and those from the most pri uh, privileged um, lost about a month and a half. It showed, and I'm, I'm trying to remember back the statistics, but they showed that something like 80% of private schools were continuing with lessons online, whereas it was only about 15 uh, or to 20% in state schools. Massive inequity. Now, there are all sorts of reasons for that. One of the points that people made really early on was digital inequality was the fact that uh, quite apart from what schools can do, if you don't have computers that you can use and you don't have Wi-Fi connections, then the notion of learning at a distance uh, is, is, is just impossible. Uh, now, if you remember, Gavin Williamson made a promise to do that, I think it was in May, but virtually nothing has happened. And still, you know, at the moment when kids are having to go home because they're having to self-isolate uh, and, and, and millions actually are, that's not being addressed. And so I think one key demand, again, it's a demand that has been made absolutely explicitly from the advisory groups, make sure that every pupil in this country is digitally connected. Address digital inequality, because if you don't address that digital inequality, you will never get educational equality, let alone other forms of equality. It's a simple demand. It's a clear demand. It's been completely uh, denied. It wouldn't do everything. It wouldn't be a bad start. Yes. Yes, this applies in the UK as it applies globally, you know, and there are massive, massive issues to think about in terms of digital inequality. Now, I have a question from our colleague, Alex Gillespie here, uh, who is a LSE faculty. To all the panel, I agree with the shift from trying to predict humans towards enabling, uh, from trying to predict humans towards enabling, supporting scaffolding their better aspects to do what is in the common good. So what is the one psychological community intervention that could be made now by governments to bring out the best in the public? Can the panel offer some ideas, comments, suggestions on that? Um. I can sort of think aloud because I think it's something I think about all the time. <laughs> um, and I suppose one of the things I often think about is a lot of what is, is often required of us is put in a lens of volunteerism, right? And sort of, which is, it's, which is a very, which is a really wonderful ideological space in sort of contributing to the common good. But you also need structural resources to enable you to have the space to do that and to participate and to live those ideas. So I guess if we wanted to sort of maintain that community spirit that was, we sort of saw in the initial stages of lockdown with the sort of the establishment of local um, sort of COVID support groups is to build the financial and structural infrastructure to enable those groups to continue, to enable them to do work, to expand their efforts um, so that it's not at a cost. Because one of the things I sort of remember from some of the very early days of my um, sort of work around um, HIV in, um, in Kingdom of Swaziland, uh, which is now Kingdom of Eswatini, um, was talking to um, women who had started up creches and were running creches to try and sort of support education of HIV orphans. And one of the things they talked about that was so clear then and sort of remains a thread I think about a lot now is the cost on them to do that work, 
the cost they bear in terms of time away from their families, the cost they bear in trying to sort of justify how they move around scarce resources to give to others, and sort of the tensions between giving in the context of constraint. And if we know that the groups who are most often sort of at those borderlands of, of need and, um, and are the ones that rely the most on these sort of community systems, then we need to resource and enable that to happen in ways that aren't at a cost mm -hmm. to communities. I yes. think that you would sort of, that's a key building of, of scaffolding that could be done um, if there was interest rather than saying, volunteerism is a spirit and we all need that spirit as if a universal blanket perspective can explain the varying levels of need that people bring to the ability to live that spirit in action. So that's yes. what I'd like to see, I think. Thank you, Rochelle. If I can use my chair privilege just to add uh, to your point by saying that uh, policy works best certainly in the global south, but I think not only in the global south, when governments and policymakers can partner effectively with local populations who are actually developing themselves impressive arrangements to fight the uh, problems and the contextual adversity they face in everyday life. So in Brazil, for instance, favela communities organize themselves, despite the fact that the Bolsonaro government did nothing about the situation. They established uh, track and trace uh, systems. They elected uh, street presidents, usually based on mother figures who know well the community, who know how to mobilize local resources. And what we need are policymakers who can partner effectively with this very impressive arrangements and work with communities rather than on top of communities. That's what produces a smart policy. And there is so much evidence showing this around the world that um, I think we have enough data now to build these interventions. Now, our, we are coming to the end of our time. I'm going to, I, I know to you, you have a hand up, Emma. I'm going to take some two more questions and perhaps you can then say something and who are, you know, the panel can react as well because soon we'll have to, to conclude. So the questions are just to, they, are, they relate to trust and distrust in the police and government. They are coming from Marit Brewer, who is an LSE visitor. Thank you, Marit, for your question. And Lisa from London. How can the government think, uh, turn things around to create a feeling of shared identity? Steve, uh, this is mainly for you. This is surely an ideal regardless of COVID. So issues of trust, issues of social identity, let's hear from our panel. These are absolutely crucial issues for building those collective re responses that have everything to do with the collective resilience we need in times of uh, uh, a global crisis such as COVID. So I will start with Ama who had her hand up. Yeah, thank you, Sandra. Just a quick one. And just to talk about Alex's question, which I guess my answer sort of leads into the answer to the, to, to, to the, the, the question that just came up. I mean, I think first of all, inequality has an impact not just on poor, vulnerable communities, but it has an impact on everybody. Um, so that's one thing that we have to bear in mind. And I think that one of the things that came up very clearly in the early months when we were thinking about, you know, COVID and vulnerable communities, not just BME communities, but poor, vulnerable communities around the UK, was this idea that there have been policies sitting around for decades, right? Rights-based policies um, that you know, sort of get um, outdoored, get launched, but never get implemented or never get the funding required to transform people's lives. And I think one single thing that can happen, I think, is to, you know, get the government to implement policies that actually are supposed to help people, pull people out of poverty, pull people out of sort of intersectional inequalities and so on. And as you talked about Brazil, these are strategies that I think governments use around the world 
child, a very kind of in intentional delay in acting on, you know, rights-based um, approaches to um, transforming society. So I think that's, if I had to say one thing that needs to happen, perhaps that should. And I think COVID, I guess, has caught the imagination of everybody. Everybody's talking about COVID being the catalyst that can change society, can change systems. And let's hope that happens. But I think if the policy is sitting around for 10 years or five years, um, you know, it, it really should be the case that this is the time to implement them, you know, rather than sort of commissioning another inquiry or commission to go into issues that we already know about. So that's my point. Thanks. Thank you. Now, our time is almost up, so I'm going to ask uh, if anyone has anything else to say from our panel, please do it and try to be as brief as possible. Yes, Steve? In many ways, it, it, it responds to the last several questions, because these issues of trust and shared identity are the same question. Trust comes from believing um, that others are you know, of you and for you. And it shows that in many ways, one of the core questions, uh, core social psychological questions is how do we felt form shared identities and shared social categories? That to me, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's, the, uh, it's a question I've been looking at for 40 years and will probably carry on until I, 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 I pass out or pass away. Or, or... Now, my answer to that actually comes to possibly my favourite quote of the whole pandemic from Bonnie Henry, who was the chief medical officer in British Columbia, when she said, um, we're all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boats. Okay? We're in very different boats. And the way in which you form shared identity is actually by making sure that we're all in boats that float. And in many ways then, again, it comes back to this issue of psychology, not rooted in cognition. We often think that shared identity comes from creating shared condition. It comes from shared practice. And part of shared practice is the rhetorical to give us a, a, a sense and understanding of ourselves, but it also depends upon a consonance between that and practices which allow us to come together and act together. And that's where the, the issue of the psychological and the issue of the material and the issues of inequities all merge. I think more and more the, the, the central thing that's coming out of this discussion for me is a psychology rooted in practice. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Well, let me thank our uh, fantastic panel for being with us today and help us to think uh, these questions. Let me thank our amazing audience who has uh, almost, we had almost 800 people with us this afternoon, asking brilliant questions, joining our conversation. Do keep yourselves connected with the school, with our series. Uh, let's keep this conversation going because that's the best tool we humans have to face uh, crisis, to face challenges, and to keep uh, ourselves afloat, uh, to use the last very opposite metaphor. Thank you very much for coming, and we hope to see you in the next event. And join me in thanking virtually uh, this amazing panel uh, that is with us today. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>